Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy Sabbath once again. Oh, good response. You are really, really encouraging me. I thank God for the worship service so far. You see, worship service doesn't start when the person that's going to share the word of God comes uh, to the front. We've been singing. We've been meditating on the word of God. Thank you for those who led us out in the offering. It's part of our worship. The children's story is part of our worship. The prayer, special music. Thank you very much. The scripture When we come to this place, we come to worship God. Let me share with you my experience this week. Generally, I would say it's been a very tough week. On Monday, at work, it was wrong. So I said, Lord, I pray. I said, Lord, Tuesday, let it be good. And I went to work on Tuesday. It was bad. Lord, how can this be? Because, I mean, I have to tell you, I'm not used to that. You know, I go to work, I pray, and it's like everything is going well for me. On Wednesday, I went to work. It was worse. So I came home, I was driving home, and I was saying, on Thursday, I have a big presentation that should capture everything I've been doing for the whole year. And I said, Maybe I should not go for a midweek prayer. Maybe I should just stay home, relax, and prepare my presentation for Thursday. Then I thank God for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said, no, go for midweek prayer and commit everything to the hands of the Lord. And I thank God for this. I want to thank God for all the people that came for midweek prayer that prayed with me. Because I pray, I said, Lord, it's been three days, really bad. I need a miracle. And God did it. On Thursday was the best of all. God took absolute control and God turned it around. Yeah. And that's why I want to testify this morning that God has been so good. Amen. Because he has taught me again just to depend on him. You see, brothers and sisters, let's face it. We're going to experience some tough times. But when we do, we also have to remember that we have a God. And when we have a God, we can go to Him and cry to Him. It's not, God doesn't want us to come to Him and pretend as if everything is okay. God wants us to come to Him and cry to Him and say, Lord, I'm feeling this pain. And He's going to step in and He'll do something for us. This morning, we're going to discuss a topic. This is Bible study. The topic is the top three Christian virtues. The question that we're going to answer this morning is who is a Christian? Who is a Christian? I know many of you, you are very good. You can say somebody that follows Christ. <laughs> well, you're going to show me how to follow Christ today. <laughs> because you can see him. How do you follow somebody that you cannot see? You don't know if it's going to the left or it's going to the right. Who is a Christian? We have millions of people today that are claiming to be Christians. Do you just believe them when they tell you they're Christians? Or maybe you yourself, you are not sure if you're a Christian or not. And so our study today, we took us to the first Corinthians chapter 13. The only way this message can be meaningful to you is if the Holy Spirit is our us and explain this to us this morning. So let us pray that the Holy Spirit will take absolute yeah. shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, thank you for bringing us together to study at your feet. We pray, Lord, that you will take over and make this message clear to us so we can see who you are. And we can learn how to follow you all the days of our lives. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me ask that question today. 
Yeah, I think we're going the wrong way.
because of what? Because of their love. I want to challenge you today, church. Where is our love? Where is our love for God? And where is our love for one another? So we're going to study those three things. In the text that we read, it says, And now abide. Let's read together. Faith, hope, and love. These three things are the greatest of these. Those are the three things that we're studying today. Because these three things are so important. If you don't have any of these three things, or if you don't have the combination of these three things, I want to tell you, stop pretending to be a Christian. There's no point pretending to be a Christian. So what is faith? What is hope? And what is love? Let me first tell you, one of the problems that we have in definition is that because we are living in this world, we define things just the way other people just define it. I'm talking about biblical faith, I'm talking about biblical hope, and I'm talking about biblical love. So we struggle with definition. Some people think that faith is just something that you just, it's a blind trust. Somebody just tells you something, just believe it. And it's very interesting that some preachers actually preach it. They think faith is just, somebody just say this is it, and you just say, yeah, that's it. No. Because in the Bible, faith is not just based on, oh, this is it, just take it through. God goes to a great extent to demonstrate his love. God is not just saying, I love you. Believe it. No. He saying, I love you. And in order for you to really understand how much I love you, look at the creation. Look at the plan of salvation. God, God is showing us some things that we can hold on to that can help us to have faith in Him. It's not a blind trust. God is not going to spank you for not just taking His words like that. He's showing us evidence. He's proving Himself. He continues to expand on why we need to have faith in Him. But that's not the way the world defines faith. The other one is hope. How do we define hope? Sometimes we define, define hope as just a desire. Oh, I hope I make more money next year. Right? right. Sounds good. Is there any assurance that I will make more money next year? No. no. That's different from the, the Bible hope. Because the hope that we have in this world it's just a desire. It might happen. It might not happen. But when we talk about the hope in the Bible, there's no maybe, maybe not. The hope that's in the Bible is not about maybe or maybe not. It's about what is going to happen and there's nothing anybody can do to change it. That's the hope that's in the Bible. And that's the hope that every Christian should have. If your hope is based on the fact that you are physically strong and you will continue to work and make money for your retirement, that's deception. Let me tell you, that's a deception. Because you never know. Nobody wish for any bad thing. But that's a flimsy hope. The hope that we're talking about today for every Christian is the hope that irrespective of what happens while we live on this part of eternity, one day we will see Jesus. And that hope, let me tell you, is sure. How about love? How does the world define love? Oh, you don't even want to go there. Love has become something else today that in fact, it's almost a shame for people to even say they love other people. 
It does not, as we saw, trampled on the floor that's almost meaningless. Don't we love chocolate now? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we've gone from loving God, loving people, we've gone to loving things, and we use the word love more for things than for people and for God. Let's remember, love in the Bible is not for things. It's for God and for one another. So we have to change the way we're thinking. We have to change the way we are interpreting things. So we're looking at these three things, faith, hope, and love. And in fact, in first, in first Thessalonians, it says, "But let us who are of the dead be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and the helmet of hope and salvation." The call of the message today is this, brothers and sisters: If we don't have faith, as defined by the Bible, if we don't have love, as defined by the Bible, if we don't have hope, as defined by the Bible, then we're not Christian. So we start the examination with ourselves. It's like, when I was preparing this in Lord, if Ademola doesn't have faith, as defined in the Bible, not as I define it, if I don't have love, as defined in the Bible, and if I don't have all as defined in the Bible, then I'm not yet a Christian. But I want to be a Christian. So I need this. So let's let's ask ourselves, what is faith? What is it? We have a very good answer in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verses 1 to 3. It says, now faith is what? Confidence in what? In what we hope for and is the assurance of what? What we do not see. Faith is a very powerful thing. Faith is a very powerful thing because all you need in faith is to look at something. Let's look at creation. How can that be? That's that God will just speak it and it just happened. Say, let there be. Let there be. And let there be. And it be. What evidence, if we believe in creation, I always ask people, if we believe so much in creation, how can we then begin to doubt the power of God? Forget about every other thing. Just focus on creation. If the God that said, let there be, is on your side, tell me another power and give examples of what that other power can do that's greater than the power of creation. Let there be. Let there be. If you have not found time to, to watch something about this universe, there are so many videos on this universe. You'll find it amazing. We see so small part of it, and we're like, oh, this is big. We have not seen anything. Faith is the confidence in what we hope for. Faith is a decision that we make to believe as true and legitimate not only what we have seen God do, but also what God has written. And that's why I tell you, Christians, we are so privileged. We have the Bible. And we can go to the Bible. And when we study the Bible, and we see all those things, we say, well, God, you did this. We read about the Red Sea. When they got to the point that there was no hope, God made the way. Is there anyone in this congregation today that's at a point that seems like a Red Sea? When you look forward, there's no way. When you look to your sides, there are hills. 
when you look at your bag, the Egyptians are coming. You tell me who can deliver you. Who can deliver you when you look at your front and your side and your back and there's no hope? It's only God. And if God did it for the Israelites, He can do it for you. Those are the things that we see when we go to the scriptures that helps us to strengthen our faith. How do you have faith? That's why the Bible is so powerful. It says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Many of us, our faith are so weak because we don't study the word of God. Because the more we study the word of God, the more we see that this God that we're serving is not a magician. He's such a powerful God. He does things that are so mighty that if we can only trust him, we will do greater things in our life. Do you want to see God? Do you want to please God? Do you want to see God? And do you want to please God? Second Corinthians 5, 7 says, For we walk by what? By faith. And not by sight. Oh, Christians. Let me go back to it. Christians always claim that they are following Christ. How do you follow Christ? With your eyes? Or maybe like me, maybe you need another extra, extra pair so you can see. Physically, can we see Christ leading us? Can we see Christ leading us? If I want to say Christ, I want to go on a journey. And I want to show me when to turn right and when to turn left. How do I know when Christ is turning left? That's faith. It takes faith and you get faith by studying the word of God. It becomes your guide. And Hebrews 11, 6 says, but without faith, it is what? It okay. Christians, do you want to please God? Yes. Huh? Do you want to please God, Christians? Yes. Amen. Bible is telling us without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we can, well, as well, pack our load and just go home. If we don't have faith, and we do not desire to have faith, because we cannot please Him. Because God requires of us to follow him. When he says, I'm going to the west, what do we do? We are following to the west. When he says, I'm going to the east, say, yeah, let's go to the east. When God says, today is a day of rest, and I want you to rest, what do we do? We rest. And that's why people of faith, they don't question God. They don't say, God, what's the difference between Saturday and Sunday? That's not faith. We're not, we're not here to start saying, okay, why do we have to take left twice? Why do we have to take right after taking a left? Can't you just make it straight, Lord? No. If we trust him enough as the captain of the ship, we will follow him, not by our side, by faith. God wants to do so many miraculous things in our lives. But we have to trust Him that He knows what He's doing. And that's how we can follow. In life, we walk by faith and not by sight. You remember what Abraham did? Brother Joe, thank you for leading us in our Sabbath school today. Abraham left his own country and was going to a land where he did not even know where he was. <laughs> because God did not tell him. And I'm going to challenge a Christian in this congregation. If God wants to take you out of this place in Houston and lead you to another place and God just wake you up in the morning and say, pack up, we're going. Going to get some flight tickets and we're going, and I'm not going to tell you where we're going. But where we're going is good. I'm sure some of us will say, Let me sleep again. So God can tell me something else. That was a bad dream. I need another good dream. 
How can I walk away from all these beautiful things and go to a place I do not know? Abraham believed God. Thank you, Brother Joe, for emphasizing that this morning. And it was counted to him as what? Well. Brothers and sisters, we cannot please God without faith. So, what do you do? Ask yourself, Lord, I want to have faith in you. Because if I don't have faith in you, I cannot even receive the gift of salvation. We all talk about salvation. We say it's a good news. Christ came, he died. All my sins are forgiven. You can only take and make use of that sacrifice by faith. You need faith to take it and make it useful. Otherwise, it's useless. And that's why Christ himself said, look, you have to trust me enough to know that I'm forgiven. How many of us sometimes feel that we have not been forgiven? And don't pretend. Sometimes you do something and you wonder if God has really forgiven you. And let me tell you, the reason why you are not feeling forgiven is not because of God. It's because you kind of wonder, how could they? It takes faith to accept forgiveness. Especially when you've gone too far. It takes faith. Christ said, I did it. You are free. No, no. You, you, you mean I'm free? Yes, you are free. But Christ, I cannot be free. No, you are free. <laughs> and some of us will struggle with it. And Christ said, it's done. And Christ said, look, you have, from now on, I want you to take my righteousness and live a new life. No, no, Christ, I need to do some work. No, I don't need your work. But I want to work and show that I'm good. No, even your... Even your righteousness is like filled with life. Don't, no, no, but Christ, I want to walk. I want to walk maybe 50% or maybe 5%. And I will take your time to 5%. You struggle with faith. But Christians, Christians must allow God to be God. He said he has done it. All you can do is to respond to what he has done in obedience, but not in the work of righteousness. God is not asking us to add to our salvation. He's only asking us to show appreciation for our salvation. So, you may ask me, but does that mean that we cannot doubt God sometimes? <laughs> Yes, we do. And it's okay. Why is it okay? Because God wants to engage us in a conversation like father to son. God wants to know where we trust him and where we're still struggling with the trust. Maybe you remember this story of this man that wanted healing for his son and he came to Christ. We always quote this. It's in Mark chapter 9, verse 23. It says, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, how many things are possible? Wow. That sounds like a blanket check. I mean, it's just a blank check. Write any amount you want on you, right? And the fact that said, I mean, this prayer, I want you to pay attention to it. Immediately, the father of this child cried out and said, with tears, Lord, I believe help my own belief. Do you see a contrast there? Lord, I do what? I believe. But at the same time, do what? Help my own belief. This man was in contrast between what he could do and what he could not do. He said, God, I'm taking this step, but I'm not really sure where I'm going to place it. But you have to help me to finish it. Christians, we don't have to pretend. And it's very interesting because especially when we want to show people that we've really been in faith, we want to show people that, you know what, we have faith in God. And that's why sometimes lead to Christians. When we are weak in faith, brothers and sisters, let's be open enough to say, Lord, 
heard my word. Lord, I don't know how you are going to pull this one off. I know you can do it. I'm not doubting you, but I just don't know how you will do it. God doesn't spank us for that. That's a relationship. See, but Lord, you mean you will do this for me? How? Lord, help my humble. Are you struggling with your faith this morning? Or your faith is so small? Don't worry. You are not the only one. You are in a good company. We struggle with faith. Today, we may be high, tomorrow we may be low. But brothers and sisters, let's stop pretending. One of the things I've seen in Christian church here that bothers me is pretense. Sometimes Christians are supposed to cry. They don't want to cry. What's wrong with us? When we need to cry to the Lord, let's cry to Him. Let's express ourselves to Him. We don't get extra credit for pretending. He wants us to come just as we are. Lord, we don't know we want to build this sanctuary. We don't have the money. We don't know how we're going to do it. Let's tell him. Let's not pretend by faith we're going to build it. We have. Let's, let's be real. He understands us. He can come and say, yeah, I know where you are. And I'm going to help you. I'm going to lift you up. The next one which is related is hope. The reason I spend so much time on faith is because if you don't have faith, forget about hope. Okay? Faith is the foundation for hope. It's your faith that brings hope. If you have not settled faith, don't even think about hope. Because in the definition for hope, there has to be something that makes you look beyond now so that you can get something else. It's the full assurance of God's promises. A very good example is that of Job. <coughs> Job was not, you know, in this island on vacation and just dreaming about God. Job was in pain. Job was in serious condition. Job was at a point that people were making fun of him. Job remember the promises. That doesn't sound now. Yeah. This is where you really see faith in action. Job remembered what God has said. Job remembered the promises that was given at the beginning. And Job said, so many things may be going wrong today, but I know that my redeemer does what? That sounds like a Christian, doesn't it? And he shall stand when? At the last day on where? On this earth. And after this thing is destroyed. Job said, listen, you may think I'm dumb, but there's one thing I know. That in my flesh, what's going to happen? I should speak. Brothers and sisters, that's for your hope. That's my hope. Let, let's not, let, you know, if you don't have this hope that one day you will see God, then you don't have hope. If you die, if I die before the second coming of Christ, we need to have the hope that when He calls out, He's going to call out your name and you will see Him. That's the hope. Your hope should not be for now you will become richer, become healthier, increase in wealth, increase in everything that will run after you. If you don't have this hope that one day you see God, you are hopeless. So I'm asking you this morning, are you a Christian? Christians, they have faith. When God tells them, they believe it. Christians, they have hope. Because they know one day they will see God. Job said, whom I shall see for myself. No one else will see God for me. I will see him myself. And my eyes will behold him. 
and the way you handled it really got me this way. He said, How my heart yearns within me. When was the last time you look forward to the day you will see God? You know, sometimes my family will go on vacation and we, you know, we check out where we're going to visit and we ah, look forward to that place. How ah, about this place? And we went to London recently and some of the places that we plan to see and when we finally saw the places that we plan to see, it was like, wow, we're here, we're in London, we're looking at all these things. You know how your heart yearns for something that you really want? When was the last time your heart yearns for you to see God? Face to face, brothers and sisters. This is not like somebody talking to you. This is somebody that you have followed all your Christian life by faith. But now you are not seeing him by faith anymore. You are seeing him face to face. That's your hope. Christians. We are people of hope. Without hope, let's just tell people, you know what, I'm just like any other. I'm not a Christian, I'm still working on it. Because our desire is to see God. You know, God is so faithful. The Bible keeps reminding us that God cannot lie. Our hope cannot be in vain, brothers and sisters. If God says you will see me face to face, he means it. And that's why we have this encouragement in the book of Hebrews. said, let us hold fast to the confession of what? Of our hope. Without wavering. Satan will tell you many reasons why you will not see God. Satan will tell you that you are so sinful, you cannot see God. Satan will tell you you are so hopeless, you cannot see God. Satan will tell you so many things, but you have to remember to hold fast to the confession of that hope that one day you will see God. And I like the way it is saying that it said, For he who promised is what? He's faithful. He's not going to deceive you, he's not going to tell you a lie. This is what Jesus said. Jesus said, You know, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, also believe in me. In my father's house are many mansions. And I want you to pay attention to the next one. He said, if it were not so, I would have done what? I mean, if it were not so, I would not raise your hopes. If it were not so, I would just tell you, don't worry, enjoy life now, and that's it. If it were not so, I would just make it clear to you, well, you know, this is how much room we have in heaven, and it's kind of full right now. <laughs> no place, it's full. No. He said, in my father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you, and I go oh my goodness, and prepare a place for you. Brothers and sisters, I need an heaven. And I go and prepare a place for you. Amen. Women, Christ is telling you that he's going to go up there and prepare a place for you. Amen. Brother Donham is telling you, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. God is going to prepare a place for each and every one of us. Amen. And I say, that's not the end. What's the point? If I prepare a place and you don't come, I'm sure ladies know how it feels. You're expecting a guest. You do all the cooking, you set the table, and then they don't come. <laughs> it's probably one of the worst feelings. Then he said, when I'm done, I will do what? I will come again. I'll come again. When I come, then I will receive you. I'm not going to send a plane ticket and say fly and come and kneel, come over. No, I'm going to come and take you and receive you to who? To myself. So that where I am, there is That's our hope, brothers and sisters. Amen. If this is not your hope, 
then you are hopeless. It may sound tough, but when we come to church sometimes, you need to just say it as it is. If you don't have this expectation that one day Jesus Christ is going to come for you, you know, sometimes we need to be, I don't want to use the word selfish, but you have to think about yourself. You know, I have to really think about it that one day Christ is going to come for me. Oh my goodness. After he has prepared the things for me. That's our hope. And that's why it's called a living hope. It's a blessed hope. There's no other thing greater than this because then when we see God, faith works. Oh, it's going to be glorious. And the third one is love. If we don't have love, everything is meaningless. Let's go to the Bible reading that we had today is in 1 Corinthians 13. If you have really been reading your Bible, you will know a lot about the, what we call the 1 Corinthian message in chapter 13. It's the love story, it's the love message, it's the love sermon. But what is love? Love is not love until it is sacrificial. Love is not love until it is sacrificial. There's just too many selfish loves these days. I want this, I want that, I want this. You just have to accept me the way I am. And we call that love? No. True love is what's shown in John 3, 16. It says, for God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. He gave. And he didn't just give one out of ten. He gave how much? All. He gave his out only because he said that also hell and belief should not perish but have That's love. The love that gives. And God is saying, you know, I understand you. We got this love. We can't just wake up one day and be like God and start acting as if we already have all the love. So again, brothers and sisters, when we come to the house of the Lord, we don't have to pretend as if we are the most loving people in the whole world because we still struggle to love one another. It's okay. It's okay if you find it difficult to relate with somebody in the church and you are working on it and you are praying about it and you are doing things that can help you to have this resolved. But don't pretend. Don't see them on the Sabbath and give them a hug and say, oh brother, I love you so much. <laughs> it doesn't, no, let's face it. God doesn't want us to relate. If you, if you read about the apostles, sometimes they disagree so much and you wonder what's wrong with them. Did you see the way Paul addressed Peter sometimes? I mean, that's true love. No pretense. There's somebody in the congregation that they do things that really bother you. Pray about it. Ask for wisdom. When you see them, greet them. But don't go to the extent of pretending and say all is well. It doesn't help. For God so loved the world that He gave. Wow, that's very powerful. Now let's go to the first Corinthians lesson. Don't worry, we're going to finish very soon. Because love is so powerful. We've talked about faith, we've talked about hope. Love is so powerful. That if you read the first three verses of First Corinthians 13, it's saying love is so powerful and so important that if you have all these other things and you don't have love, these things are meaningless. Wow! And when you look at this list, they are the things that if I have them, oh my goodness, I can brag around as a Christian. Gift of tongues of men and angels? Oh my goodness. That's good enough to have a mega church. <laughs> I mean, think about it. 
<laughs> gift of prophecy. I'm going to write something on paper and tell you what's going to happen to you tomorrow. Oh my goodness, it's a great thing. And I can fathom all mysteries and knowledge. Uh oh. How about faith that can move mountains? Wow! That's really cool. I'm really nice. I'm going to give all my possessions, even though I don't have much. I'm going to give all to the poor. And people will look at me and say, wow, look at him. He's so nice. He's so selfish. He's giving everything to the poor. I've never seen anybody like him. Oh, the waterfall. I don't even care about my life. I'm going to give my body to the poor. What? This is too much. And first Corinthians 13 says, if I do all those things and I don't have love, zero. What? This is to tell you how important love is. Love is that thing that makes you a Christian. If you don't have love in your heart, Great things, you can pray for people and they can be healed. You can give so much. You can walk into this church and give us the money we need to be the sanctuary. That's great. We'll take it. You can do many things. But without love, zero. Vanity. The purpose of that verses 1 to 3 is for each and every one of us to think about it. Oh my goodness, I need this law. I want this law. I don't want everything to be in vain. And it goes further to talk about the law. If you are following, I decide not to be reading it, but you can be reading it. I summarize it like this. Because this expression of love, first, it tells us the things that that love is not. And when I was reading this, I realized that everything that it talks about is everything that we have naturally. We envy. It's natural to Oh, look at him. I wish I can have what he has or what she has. We boast. I work for this thing. Just in case you don't know, I work for it. We're proud. It's about me, me, me. And let's face it, we can be very rude. Because we don't, we're not sensitive to the feelings of other people. Self-seeking. Anger, easily. I like that part because I think anger is okay, but anger easily may not be. Keeps no record of the wrongs. Does not delight in evil. And love never falls. Wow. I can see that in myself. And I've walked around many Christians and I know that I've not seen that in many other Christians. And the only one who is perfect with all these examples happens to be Christ. So when we talk about the love in 1 Corinthians, it's talking about Christ himself. Christ is the perfect example of 1 Corinthians 13. He is the one that has all the characters. And the good news is this. He can impart those characters to us. He can teach us how not to be envious. He can teach us how not to be boastful. He can teach us how not to be Proud. He can teach us humility. Oh, so what do I need to have love? I need to have Christ. Oh, and when I have Christ and I walk with Him, He will teach me. Wow, that's good news. So what's love? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love rejoices with truth. Love protects. Trust, hopes, perseveres. Amazing! These are the characters of Christ. 
That's why I try to encourage you. I say, please, check your life. Are you growing as a Christian? Is there anything changing in you? Because if you have been with Christ, Christ will help you to improve. And so we need to begin to express your love. And that's why the commandments were summarized into two. Love God and love one another. If you fulfill that, oh, you do. And you know, Christ said it, if you love me, do what? It's amazing how love can drive us into obedience. So many of us we struggle with obedience. We want to do everything that God asks us to do. So we're going, we're getting at it from the wrong side. We're trying to be good, but He said, "No, love me." And then, because now it's coming out of love, it's flowing in you out of love. It's amazing how that happens. As we begin to close, these three things we cannot forget. Faith, hope, and love. The text says they are bound together. They are deeply connected together. But the greatest of all is love. Love is the foundation. You need faith in order for you to have hope. But you need these three things in order for you to say you're Christian. First John 3 to say, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when it is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Amen. You know, faith is good. Hope is good. But one day, we will not be there anymore. Because when we see Jesus, when we see God face to face, our faith now becomes sight. Because wherever He goes, we can see Him. We just walk with Him. And our hope is no longer needed because our hope has been achieved. We are right here in His presence. But remember, it's only love. That will remain when we get to heaven. Because that time is going to be perfect now. Continue to love one another. Continue to love God. Continue to live in harmony and peace. And that's why today I want to encourage you. If you think your faith is small or you lack faith, pray to God. If you cannot see the hope that one day you will see Jesus, make it right with him. And if you're struggling with love, God himself is love. And he reaches out to us in love. And as we respond to him in love, we begin to learn how to love. It's not something that just happens with us. Somebody says, pray for your enemy. I say, don't pray for your enemy on your first day of becoming a Christian. you only be an angry Christian. <laughs> don't pray for your enemy on the first day. Grow as a Christian to the point that you can start praying for your enemies. Otherwise, you'll be so angry. So please, brothers and sisters, this is a journey. And as we close, I'm not sure if you know this man, Edward Mott. Edward Mott was born in the 1700s. He was a pastor of a Baptist church. But before he became a pastor, he was actually born to an unbeliever family. The parents, they had a nightclub. And sometimes they would even leave him and they would go to their nightclub. But one day, while interacting with his friends outside the house, he became a Christian. And he decided to dedicate his life. For the service of God. And so for the rest of his life, he worked as a pastor. He wrote this beautiful hymn, 522, Jen, you know, I'm going to pick on you to pray for us, sorry. <laughs> he wrote that my home is built on what? And church, I want to challenge you to it. Our faith, our hope, and our love, they should be built on nothing else. On God. So where's your faith? 
should be on God. Where's your hope? It should be in the Father. One day, we will see Jesus. Amen. And where's your love? It has to be on God. And as we close, I want to ask you to please join me as we stand together. Let's go on to 522 and sing and have the hope and the faith.